Welcome back, everyone, to episode number 36 of the Beginner to Master Free Run. Coming into today, rated 1491 on a win streak of 112 games. So I'll try and keep it going. I'll try and break 1500 today. Let's hop into the first game. All right, first opponent playing Z24V. Taking a little bit of time on the first move. Not something that I see too often. Usually my opponents are ready to make their first move. But it is a complicated position. White does have a lot of legal options. How many options? 16 plus 4. Right? 16 different pawn moves. 4 different knight moves. Okay, chess.com is saying the game will auto-abort in... About 20 seconds. So not quite the start I was expecting. But sometimes this will happen. Okay. <laughs> Let's try this again. New game. Okay, new opponent. Playing Martin Hummer. And we'll have a Queen's Pawn opening. Queen's Gambit. Play the Queen's Gambit to client. Knight of 3 is um, yeah, a very fine move. Usually white plays knight c3 or knight f3. And we see bishop to g5. So this is definitely a very common approach. Uh, very often white's going to follow through with knight c3 and e3. So I think what I'll do is I'll go for a Cambridge Springs, which starts with c6 and then knight d7. And if white plays knight c3, which white doesn't play, unfortunately, I was going to play queen a5. That would have been the start of the Cambridge Springs. But um, yeah, e3, it's a kind of prophylactic move where it prevents bishop to b4. Now I am wondering if I can still play queen a5, because this move has a few benefits. Of course, it gets tempo against white's king. And if queen a5, b4, I can then take, because a pawn would be pinned to the rook. And meanwhile, if knight c3 in that line, so queen a5, knight c3, I would have knight e4, which I think is pretty good for black. So yeah, let's go for queen a5. Not the typical Cambridge Springs, but maybe we'll get some transposition. And of course, knight d2 or queen d2 are also possible. Oh, white plays b4, showing no fear about the pin. I mean, maybe showing some ignorance about the pin. Yeah, I'm going to be happy to take. I'm pretty sure this was an oversight from white. And now I think things are already looking very good for black. If takes, I'll, I'll win rook for bishop. Actually, rook and pawn for bishop. My queen shouldn't be in too much danger there. And then if white blocks... Now I do have to deal with the pawn attacking the bishop because the rook is defended. So the pawn's no longer pinned. Um, I could take definitely one option. Uh, bishop c3 looks interesting as well. Attacking the rook. And then maybe preparing knight e4. Well, yeah, let's start with bishop to c3. I think white is going to be still under a lot of pressure here. Rook is attacked. Knight is pinned. And if I get in this move knight e4, I'm hitting the knight on d2 again. I'm hitting the bishop on g5. The rook a2 is very logical to try and over defend the knight. Let's hop in with my knight. And there is one kind of recurring tactical theme in the Cambridge Springs. When you have the queen on a5 aligned with the bishop, very often the bishop on g5 is a tactical target. Uh, there are ways for white to go wrong here. Like bishop d3 would be a blunder. Because then I could take, and then take, and then eventually win a piece. But white's aware of the danger. And now, I mean, if I take on d2, knight takes d2, we're trading. Not quite winning anything. I'm inclined here to play knight df6. Let's go ahead and play this. Very simply looking to get this other knight into play. Now I'm probably threatening to take, and then if takes, I can move this knight to e4. So white trades, which makes sense. 
And now I have to decide, do I want to keep my knight on e4 and take with a pawn? Or do I want to avoid double pawns and take with a knight? I think both moves are probably very fine. I mean, taking with a pawn, I don't think it's the worst thing ever. I like, guess my pawns are doubled, but I have a bit more central control. And I keep all the pressure against white's knight on d2. And I open the g-file. So yeah, I'm going to take with pawn. Taking with knight was maybe a bit more standard there. And then just look to castle. But I imagine my king should be pretty safe if, if it just stays in the center. And now I do have the option of playing pawn f5. Reinforce the knight on e4. And I should note that white is defending the knight, what, four times. So the king's not actually tied down. Like, white is probably looking to castle next move. And it's not easy to add another attacker. So, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and play f5. Just reinforcing, ensuring that if white takes, I'm probably likely to take back with the f-pawn and have three center pawns. So white does castle. And now, yeah, this knight is no longer pinned. White might be having ideas of knight to b3. Oh, you know what? Did I just miss a tactic? Maybe missed a tactic that previous move, but I can still go for it. Is bishop takes d2. Yeah, I should have played this a previous move, and now knight c3. A very simple fork, because I've cleared the c3 square. I should note now that um, yeah, the queen can't really move to d2 or e1 to pin. Knight's in the way. And I don't see any great counterattacks for white either. So probably should have spotted that sooner. It's possible that white... Did white have... Bishop takes e4 here, maybe, to not lose material. You can always analyze after the game. But now things are looking very good. I mean, I've won a pawn, and now winning likely rook for knight. Uh, of course, the one downside of my position is this bishop on c8. I have put most of my pawns on light squares. Almost all of my pawns on light squares. That's a common... Um, Common feature of playing the Cambridge Springs, not the best opening to have an active light squared bishop. But I imagine, hopefully in the, the near middle game, I'll have ideas of like b6 and bishop a6. Uh, but white plays a very interesting counterattack, knight b3. So if I take the queen, then it's just a queen trade. Probably don't want to go into that. But thankfully I can play probably just queen c7. Saving my queen, keeping the fork. And yeah, the queen has access to d2 now, but queen d2 would not be a pin. Remove my queen from a5. I'm guessing white's gonna move the queen to defend the rook. Let's say queen c2, I'll take and then take. And life should be very fine for black. Yeah, now we're entering a different stage of the game, up material. I do have some issues to solve. I would like to get my king to some safer place. Maybe I can castle and play king h8. Um, but I'm also trying to just think long term how I activate the bishop. I mean, b6 looks very reasonable here. Not only looking to develop the bishop, but also looking to restrict the knight. Um, generally, when white has a knight on b3, pawn on b6 is very nice at uh, limiting the knight squares. So the game is definitely not over, but uh, I think everything is under control. White takes on d5. Makes sense. I probably don't want to take back, leaving myself with the isolated double f-pawns. So I'll take this way. And this does open the c-file and the diagonal, so white could get some uh, tempo moves, as we call them. Moves with basic threats to win time. 
But if bishop b5, probably don't mind playing bishop d7. And if rook c1, can slide my queen to a, a safer place. Yeah, queen d6 looks very fine here. So I'm down a little bit of time, but still a lot of time left to uh, play the end game. Or the late middle game, I should say. Pawn a4. And yeah, now it's probably time to castle. Just because most of white's pieces are on the queen side, uh, my king is very safe on the king side, despite the half open g file. And I think it's likely that maybe at some point I'll play king h8, rook g8, maybe try and use the g file. Um, the other idea with castling is simply to connect the rooks. Like if I play bishop d7, the rooks are connected, and that's beneficial because it allows me to fight for the c file with the eventual rook c8. But white's trying to migrate the queen to the king's side. Makes sense. I mean, queen h5, I don't think is really an immediate threat. Although maybe white wants to play this and then g4 and create some chaos. So yeah, I'm going to start with king h8. Or do I? Do I want to start with this? I'm realizing king h8, queen h5. I don't quite have rook g8 because it allows queen takes f7. And there's also queen e7, get the queen to maybe a more defensive square. Yeah, I'm going to play queen e7. It's a safe move. Just trying to make sure the queen's not really coming in to cause too much damage. And the downside of having this construction with pawns on light squares is that uh, the dark squares are naturally undefended by the pawns. So that's where the queen kind of fills in, covers the key dark squares here on the king side. Queen d2, a slightly mysterious move. Um, debating where to put the bishop. I'll play bishop d7, attacking the pawn. This does allow rook c7 with a pin on the 7th rank, but then I could respond with queen d6. And now, yeah, let's fight for the c file. I mean, I think at this point in the game, I just want to simplify. Be nice to trade a pair of rooks. If we trade pawns, and I'll have a passed pawn on the queen side. So white avoids the trade. Um, I'll play rook c7. Kind of a slow looking move, but I really just want to double up. A nice thing about having two rooks when the opponent only has one rook is that uh, I can double up and basically dominate the file. And I'll do that here. Rook ac8. I'm not quite infiltrating yet. I mean, white's controlling c2 and c1 quite well. Maybe there's some ideas of queen a3. Okay, so we trade on b6. It's nice maintaining the pawn on b6. The knight still can't hop in. If my pawn were on b5, then the knight would find a really nice square on c5. But thankfully, that's not going to be the case. And this knight is pretty much a dead piece on b3. I can't move forward. Moving backwards isn't really productive. Okay, we see g4. White is trying to muddy the waters. And this might help me more than it helps white. If I take and take. And queen g5. Yeah, I'm going to start by taking, and it does open the bishop, but with queen g5, putting immediate pressure. We might be reaching a situation where both white and black are going to be trying to attack on the king side. I should note that pawn e5 might be a resource here. White starts with f3. And there's also h5 or f5. 
Might as well play h5. I do have to be careful with potentially allowing the rook to come to the g-file. Maybe white will try and slide the king somewhere and prepare rook g1. Uh, but with most king moves, that could allow queen h4. So I'm liking the looks of this. Queen h2. A clever move. Because now if I take, there's queen h7, which I don't want to deal with. Although queen h2, it kind of abandoned e3. It didn't spot that right away, but this is a not only a free pawn, but soon to be free bishop. I'm down about a minute here. But it looks like I should be cleaning up. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take the bishop. Now attacking the rook. The knight is also a target. And it's true that my king's exposed, but can't imagine how white's gonna exploit my king. I'll go for rook c2 here. Finally invading the second rank. And now the queen's attacked, the knight's attacked. There's gonna be mating ideas too. Queen d1 in the air. Yeah, queen d1 is now made in two. So nice swift way to convert the position. And white has one legal move. And that's resignation. And uh, yeah, got to 1500 on the dot with that win. I think overall that was a pretty nice clean game. Um, I mean, one difference that I've been seeing in the recent episodes uh, playing these players rated around 14, 1500 is that when they get worse positions or when they're down material, they're still very good at fighting. And my opponent uh, fell into trouble early in the opening, blundering with this move pawn b4. Uh, white probably should have played queen d2 or knight d2. But um, yeah, even after losing the pawn, white still managed to make it a game. And it took a lot of work for me to, uh, to win the position. Now, I do want to note here, I probably missed a tactic for, for a few moves. Um, yeah, bishop takes d2. I should have just played right away. Uh, I think at the moment I was very content on leaving the pin, but this would have forced takes and then knight c3 with the fork, so I could have gotten the tactic much sooner. Um, and actually what happened in the game is when I finally spotted that I could take and prepare knight c3, white did have the chance to take my knight. And yeah, bishop takes e4 would have saved white from losing more material. And if I take back, then white can take on d2 and turn on the eval bar. Uh, and white's actually for choice here, surprisingly enough. Even though black is of a pawn, um, this bishop is just a bad piece. And yeah, white has pretty good compensation, maybe f3 coming. Um, so I guess I'm fortunate that my opponent uh, still allowed this fork. And then I think from here, things were pretty smooth sailing. Won the rook. Uh, c file opened, but eventually was able to use the c file. And yeah, g4, maybe somewhat self destructive. Uh, maybe white should have prepared g4 with queen e2, but all worked out in the end. And yeah, hopefully some lessons to take away in that one. So let's keep it going, and I'll play another game. Next opponent playing Calexico. And we have another Queen's Pawn opening d4, d5. Are we going to see... Okay, we don't see a Queen's Gambit. We see a London. And against the London, I'll play um, what is usually a, a reverse Queen's Gambit, pawn c5. c3, knight c6. And white plays this... Uh, this is probably the most common move order, at least around this rating level, with knight f3 and e3. Uh, the drawback of this move order is I can play queen b6, and I'm already threatening queen takes b2 to trap the rook, or at least to win a pawn and potentially win another pawn. Uh, and this is known to be quite good for black, at least in, in a lot of the main lines. Now queen c1, not the most common move, but it does defend 
the v2 pawn. And really at this point, I just want to complete development. I have a choice here between bishop f5 or bishop g4. Definitely want to develop this bishop before playing e6. Um, I think I'll play bishop f5, simply preventing bishop d3. And the bishop does a nice job piercing through white's position. And now I could start with e6, mainly debating between pawn e6 or rook c8. I mean, the one thing I have to watch out for is if I play e6, white could maybe play knight h4 and trade knight for bishop. So like sometimes it can make sense to play h6, give the bishop a square, and then play e6. So I'm actually debating between e6, h6, and rook c8. Um, I kind of like playing rook c8 first. I think this is a more flexible move. I'm also making it so I might have ideas of taking and then using the c-file pin. Like here, if I take, let's say pawn takes and then knight b4, not sure how good that actually is. Like white could just castle, knight c2, rook b1. But now actually, yeah, rather than going for taking, I'm going to just start with pawn e6. And if white goes for this move, then I can take and exploit the pin and probably win a pawn on d4. Now white's just castling, maybe not even thinking about uh, the lines that I'm calculating. But that's okay. I'll continue developing bishop e7. I think this trap is still existing in the position, like knight h4, pawn take pawn. If white includes this, like takes and then takes and then takes. An idea is to eventually take on d4. Could get a little bit weird though. I'm trying to imagine if takes and then takes then my rook is actually pinned, or my, my knight is pinned to my rook on the c file. White plays h3, so yeah, very typical move. Also, yeah, preparing to meet knight h5 with bishop to h2. And I'm still trying to decide, like, do I want to play h6 or do I want to castle? I castle knight h4. I don't think there's any need to play h6. I'm going to castle. This way, my rook on c8 is now defended. White goes for knight h4. And I think finally we're going to see what I was just trying to explain with the c file. What do we call this? X ray vision alignment of the rook and the queen. So I can leave the bishop on f5, take on d4. And even though I'm allowing the trade and maybe getting double f pawns, I think eventually I'm going to win the pawn on d4. Taking a pause here, always should consider the other captures. But if I take either pawn, then white can take the bishop with check. So take the knight. Now it's possible my opponent is realizing uh, the mistake that they've made here. Because if takes, I take. There is a line bishop e3 to try and pin, but I would meet the pin with a fork. Knight takes e2, hitting the king and the queen. So I play knight b3 instead. And yeah, I'm going to be winning a pawn. It is a question which pawn I want to take. I mean, if I take c3, I think taking c3 is a bit more attractive, because if I take e3, the bishop can take attacking my queen. Let's go ahead and play this. In this case, I think I'll be keeping the initiative. Because if pawn takes, white's not really making any threats. And, and the move that sticks out here is knight to e4. Especially with the isolated pawn on c3, I can't be defended by another white pawn. It's on the half-open c file. And if I play knight e4 and bishop f6, I can have a lot of attackers against c3. So the only thing I'm not quite sure about is if knight e4 and then white plays f3. 
Is it worth maybe losing time with the knight? 94, F3, then I might have to retreat. And there is also 94, F3, knight, C5. And maybe there's an interesting maneuver. Give takes, takes, I'll be happy to get my bishop to C5. And in this line, if white doesn't take on C5, I can then maneuver my knight to E6, which is actually a nice square to hit the bishop, maybe support F4. So I'll go for knight e4. White plays rook b1. Okay, natural move, aligning with my queen, probably setting up some discoveries like knight d4, attack my queen in the pawn. I, mean, I don't really have too many options with my queen. There's queen d8, not the most appetizing option. And there's knight b4, which looks kind of unnecessary. But I am curious about this move, knight b4, because white can't take. And if white moves a knight, I can just take the pawn with my knight or my rook. So I don't have much time to calculate, but I'm going to play this move. I really don't see anything wrong with this. It is very counterintuitive to like put the knight where the pawn and rook are targeting it. But I think my threats are going to basically trump white's threats. Especially if I can take on c3, I'll be hitting the rook and the bishop. Uh, so white does play knight d4. I'm debating between knight takes c3 or rook takes c3. But I'm liking knight takes c3. Because I'm not only hitting the rook, I'm threatening to take the bishop with the, uh, what is this, quadruple attack. Also discovered attack against the queen on the c-file. So, I, mean, I think I'm going to be winning more material. White has no time to take on f5. I don't think white has time to even save the rook. I mean, knight takes e2 is the biggest threat in the position. I think white's going to have to probably lose exchange. Queen d2. I'll take the, the rook. Imagine we're going to see rook takes b1. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, or what I was talking about earlier is even when players around this rating lose material, they still try and like keep fighting. Like There's counterplay, white's threatening pawn a3 to try and win back material. F pawn is still hanging too. So what's the best way to deal with this position? I definitely don't want to lose the knight. I'll probably have to lose the pawn. Could play queen a5. And queen a5 looks to be a fine move, but then knight takes. And there's also queen c5. Just a little bit worried about the knight coming here. And pawn a5 I don't think works because pawn a3. Okay, I think queen a5 should be okay. And then if knight takes, I play bishop c5. Oh, we see pawn a3. And with pawn a3, I have the move knight c6. I also have the move queen takes a3. But I think I'd rather just try and trade queens here. Like white doesn't have time to take because then I take on d2. I mean, that is maybe a possible line to take and take. But uh, yeah, black should still be for choice in that line. And if white takes here, I can take here, defending the pawn on b7 and simplifying into the endgame. Which, uh, yeah, is happening. Now, I mean, I might as well take on a3. 
I'm not scared of this move. I have rook c1 in that line. Force a trade of the rooks. And, I mean, yeah, these pieces would be a lot scarier if queens were still on the board. If white had a queen here to work with, create some mating ideas against g7, and maybe it would be uh, not so easy. But this position, I'm very happy to simplify. Rooks are coming off. There is this check. Thankfully, it's not checkmate. There's no duck on h8 to, to smother me. I guess I do lose a d-pawn. But now it's time to start looking to push my, my past pawns. I'm basically making way for the a-pawn to move. I imagine it's not going to be easy for white to stop this pawn. Although maybe there is bishop b5 or knight c3, okay. White's preventing pawn a4. I'll put the rook behind the pass pawn. Yeah, at this point I just want to try and keep moving quickly. Play pawn a4. Yeah, now we see the rook. The rook's going to be supporting the pawn. Probably for the rest of the pawn's journey to queening. Knight a2, okay, so white's basically setting up a blockade on a2. But I don't really mind that. I mean, I have the b pawn to push eventually as well. Okay, bishop d5. We'll start with pawn f6. Preparing bishop to e5. Let's just go ahead and trade bishops. And maybe I could have started with g5, but yeah, I'm happy to simplify. King's coming to e4. So yeah, what to do here? Maybe I can start with this move. Because then the king's tied down to f2. Now this move. I still have to watch my time. I'm trying to provoke white to play pawn e4 so the knight can come in and then this pawn can start moving. White's still being stubborn. So I'm going to make way for my king. I mean, sometimes uh, the approach to win end games like this is just to be patient, try and gradually optimize all the pieces, also play in a, a preventive manner. So, making sure this pawn is staying alive. A king's cut off, so king can't really help try and win the pawn. I mean, at some point I probably want to prepare pawn b5. <clears throat> like, maybe rook b8. I want to keep the rook cutting off the king. Um, yeah, maybe I can start with king g5. Actually, work on both sides of the board. If the king moves to f3, I can infiltrate with my rook. Yeah, let's go in, king h4. That was not my first intention with activating my king, but white gave me the opportunity to kind of enter, enter their territory. In 45 seconds, it's not a lot of time, but it should be enough. And now I just want to push my h-pawn. Can pre-move the capture. I mean, hopefully this is a, an instructive endgame for the viewers. I mean, sometimes to win endgames like this, you have to kind of work on both sides of the board. And especially when the opponent does try to resist. Just want to be patient. Okay, here I'm forking the king and bishop. Uh, it's really close to mate. I might not need to queen a pawn now, now threatening mate in one. 
Okay. So hard fought game. Um, I feel like both games so far this episode have kind of fit a similar theme. I mean, both have been Queen's Pawn openings where I won material pretty early. And I actually won material in a similar manner in both games, uh, using a pin that my opponent overlooked from early on this game. It was the rook along the c-file. Um, maybe it wasn't quite a pin, but if white were to take, then the c-pawn would be pinned. And uh, yeah, this is all the whole strategy behind my setup with the early rook c8. So going back to what happened in the game, um, yeah, I think it was pretty smooth. Things got a little bit funky around here with knight b4, but uh, knight b4 was one of the best moves. And after knight d4, I won the pawn, but my opponent did fight. And yeah, I think around here, oh wow, let me turn on the eval bar. Yeah, when I played queen a5, white is actually substantially better here because of knight takes f5. And this would have been a situation where queens stay on the board and white would have a pretty nasty attack. Now, I was calculating this and I was envisioning bishop c5 here, but that allows queen b2. Wow, and then g7 is hit. If I play f6, white has only one winning move it's actually kind of a natural move just to play a3, uh, essentially guaranteeing to win material. If I drop back the knight, white can take. And amazingly, there's no good way for black to defend against mate in this position. And that could have easily happened. Like This would have stemmed from um, knight takes f5 and bishop c5, which I was kind of ready to go into. Uh, thankfully, this didn't happen. And instead of... Uh, yeah, instead of taking the pawn immediately, white played a3 a bit too soon, allowed the queen trade, and then, yeah, then I lived happily ever after. So very fortunate to not get into trouble that game. Um, yeah, do have to be aware of, of what the opponent wants to do. So if I go back to, to this position, yeah, so queen a5 was actually a big mistake. Uh, the best move would have been queen f6 and then the idea is if rook takes b4 black can play g5 man these are some engine lines but pawn g5 i guess the idea is if bishop h2 there's going to be takes and some back rank ideas if bishop g3 then there's takes takes and f4 and yeah black's for choice here i mean it's rook for two minors but uh yeah black has full control. So yeah, some crazy lines that could have happened, but uh, nice scheme to uh, to continue the winning streak. Uh, let's keep it going. Let's do one more. And this time I'm white. I think we'll keep the theme for today. I'll have another d4 opening, uh, but this time playing the white side of pawn d4. Opponent's playing e6, so offering a French but yeah, let's go for a London. Let's uh, I'll try and show how to play the London in a proper manner. Although against d6, uh, I don't think I want to actually continue with the normal London because Black's giving me the chance to just control the center right away. Um, so there's cases where like, even if you're a, a hardcore London system player, you should be ready to adapt and play what the position calls for. So grabbing a bit more space here, um, we'll keep developing, try and move somewhat quickly in the opening. Uh, I'll play bishop d3. Now, I do want to admit that I'm already like, dreaming of another Greek gift. Uh, we have had the two past episodes of the speedrun featuring the Greek gift um, in some way. But yeah, might be hard to achieve here. Like pawn c5. E5 comes to mind. E5 takes, I take and hit the bishop. I mean, if e5, there's takes and takes and knight d5. 
and the bishop on f4 is hit. So I have to be careful here. I mean, if black has a chance to take and take, then I get forked. So I think I have to respond to this move. Uh, d5 might be the most principled move, but then it gives black the option to play e5 and kick the bishop. So I'm actually leaning towards taking the pawn on c5. It might be the simplest way to go. I'm actually thinking about takes and then takes and then h4, which would set up the idea of playing e5 and then going for a Greek gift. But first things first. Okay, let's take the pawn. Black takes back. And again, if I play d5, or if I play e5, knight d5, and I don't really want to trade or lose time having to move the bishop. But if I get the chance to play h4 and then e5, then there's a potential line where we can trade, I can sack, and then check, and then go for the mating attack. And I think I'm, I'm just too eager to make that happen. So I'm going to play pawn h4 here. It's probably not objectively the best move, um, but I don't think it's a bad move. And black might be allowing it now. So pawn e5, knight e5. I could even start by taking, and then take, and then check. And then, yeah, if the king moves back, I think it's a pretty classic Greek gift. And for anyone watching that hasn't seen the previous two episodes of the speedrun, uh, I've had basically the same pattern of bishop, knight, and queen uh, trying to attack on the king side. Um, but this time, okay, my opponent plays knight h5, which does change things perhaps a little bit. Uh, the first move to calculate is bishop takes h7. But I'm not sure about this, because takes and then check. And if takes, like I want to take back, but then the queens could get traded. So honestly, I might be better off just retreating the bishop. There's also the line takes and takes and check and then king g6. And at first, it seems like it should be really good for white, the king coming to g6. But black is still offering a queen trade there. And my bishop is still attacked. I guess I'd have to calculate queen g4. That's a very hard line to judge. But if I play bishop e3, I think this is much easier to understand. So I'm keeping the option open of potentially sacking. But I'm also maybe just preparing to trap the knight with pawn g4. And bishop g5 has some similar logic to it. But I like bishop e3, just avoiding trade the bishops, kind of keeping the, the status quo of the position, not going all out right away. After the game, I can analyze if uh, bishop takes h7 was playable. But black plays g6, uh, it's a very logical move, making a square for the knight. And now I think it's time to attack. I, I can't win material, but I can still play g4 and go for the pawn storm. Now, pawn h5, probably one of my first choices. And I'm almost certainly not casting kingside this game. And more likely, I'll eventually castle queenside. But I like starting with h5, essentially guaranteeing that the rook will have some influence. And if the h file opens, then um, yeah, the rook will have a very nice attacking potential. I mean, maybe someday the queen can come in via the diagonal. And it's really not an easy position for black to like, figure out a productive move. Taking would just open the king side. If black pushes, then I can probably push. Black plays f5. So there's actually a few different ways to take this pawn. You can take the normal way or take en passant. If I take en passant, then I open the bishop. So let's imagine takes and then takes and then takes. 
Ah, so maybe after takes, a rook will take defending g6. Should also mention that h6 almost traps a knight, but there is knight e8. I don't want to be closing the h file. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take. I just want to open the bishop. If the rook takes, then I can probably attack it, like g5 or knight e4. But bishop takes, so now I can take here. And yeah, now I think we're seeing the, the black king side crumbling. Because um, I can take on g6. Although it's not simple. If I take on g6, the queens get traded. If I take with rook there, there's takes and takes. And in the very end, my knight is hanging on f3. So I have to be really, really careful. Um, maybe better just to move my queen first. And avoid all the issues. Yeah, I'm going to move the queen first. It is maybe a little bit slow, but it also prepares to queenside castle. And the pawn is still a weakness. Like if black defends a pawn, I can keep attacking with rook h6. It is possible here that maybe black can go for takes and takes and queen d5. And there's some, some counterattack. At the very least, I have rook h3 there. Black plays b6. So that's probably a welcome sight. Yeah, I think I'll just go ahead and now take. So now there's no queen trade. I mean, bishop h7 is an idea. I've taken a lot of time early in this game to kind of sift through my options. But should hopefully be paying off. Okay, 95 is played. So if I take and then take, I could also start with checking. Yeah, actually, there is a, a forcing line here. I'll start by checking. And then I'll take, assuming bishop takes, I have queen f3, which will attack the king and the rook. And yeah, it felt like tactics were bound to happen in that position, just with white having so many attackers. If king e7, I could consider bishop g5 first. But I think maybe I'll just take the rook first. Ah, there is queen f6. Oh, this is not actually so simple. I kind of forgot about that move. If I take, then takes, takes, takes. If I move my king, I lose my queen. There's bishop a6 in the end of some of these lines. Uh, yeah, queen f6 is very resourceful. So if I take, and then take, and then take... Yeah, it might be too risky to actually take the rook as much as I want to. And nice thing is I'm up a pawn. I don't need to take too much risk here. I'm going to take the queen. Now, of course, this is not what I was initially planning for, like trading queens with black's king on f7. But I feel like it was called for there. At least uh, the position is still looking good. Time situation, of course, is low. But uh, and there's still attacking potential for white. And g5 is in the air, 94. Not to mention this move. Yeah, that was one of the points of casting greenside. It's to basically prevent bishop b7. And now I can take on b7. Okay, so a quicker win compared to the previous games. Um, there's definitely a lot to analyze in this game. And let's go back, we can zoom through the opening. Not the most theoretical opening what my opponent played, but uh, yeah, we got a very interesting position. 
And I guess I want to start around here because I was tempted to go for bishop takes h7, but the engine's not impressed. It's actually saying that the position's equal and black could play king g6 here. King g6 would have been the best move. Now this would have gotten really crazy because there's queen g4 and black has to be precise. Uh, the only move to survive for black is bishop takes g5. And then, wow, apparently the only move for white not to be worse is not to take the bishop, but to play rook d1. And then knight d4, I'm just playing through the top engine line. Like somehow this is equal after all said and done. Queen takes g5, white's down a piece, but has queen h2. And engine is just giving zeros. So, I mean, I didn't go for this line because it did look a little bit too murky. And bishop e3 was just a better choice. Uh, and after g6, yeah, things were looking very good. And I guess the next moment was around here. Like with queen e2, uh, the first move I wanted to play was bishop takes g6, but this would have allowed either queen takes d1 or first bishop takes c3. And after takes and then takes and then takes, black is winning the knight on f3. Now this is still fine for white somehow, even though black just won a piece, the engine finds some forcing line, bishop h7, and then bishop e4. Somehow the rook is getting trapped. Rook f6, I assume, pawn g5. So yeah, I, I didn't want to go for that. Looked a little bit too messy. Uh, I went for more controlled move of queen e2. And after b6, then we went into this line. And yeah, I just want to show this, because after queen f6, initially my plan was to take the rook. But uh, yeah, this gives black some counter chances. Bishop takes e3, takes and takes. And it's very easy for white to misstep here. These king moves... Uh, would just lose the queen uh, with bishop a6. So white is still apparently better because after king d1 and takes and king d2, my queen defends a rook from corner to corner. But uh, yeah, this just looks like a, a big mess and material is actually equal here. So I didn't go for that. I instead traded queens and then was pretty quickly rewarded with rook d7. So very interesting game. Uh, didn't quite see a Greek gift in that game, but uh, got kind of close. My bishop still found its way to h7. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, some fun games in this episode. As always, if you have questions, leave them below. And if you do like the content, do subscribe. It does help the channel. And I'll see you guys soon.